Good evening, folks. I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. You've caught us again here, and we're at Juxtaposition Live at 525-ish. Uh, we're here today just to talk a little bit about Legacy Makers, and I'm, I'm hoping you're um, along for the ride. Uh, again, um, I am so pleased right now to have uh, in my presence uh, one of our Legacy Makers, one of our community Legacy Makers here and it is no less than the director of the Richard Kemp Center. This is uh, my wife, Christine Hughes. <laughs> How you doing, Christine? Good, glad to be here. Thank you for joining us. The, the systemic racism is really what we're talking about today, and I, I know when today we were talking about the program, I uh, wanted to just get the opportunity to check in with you because all of the work that y'all have been doing in the community, uh, and also obviously just get a chance to hang out because when else are we gonna spend some time together? Right. So I'm glad you joined. Thanks uh, for joining us. Systemic racism, what does that mean? Systemic racism, it means um, there are wealth disparities, cultural disempowerment among uh, black folks. Uh, as a result, disparities exist in education, health services, the justice system. Uh, these disparities along with cultural erasure and appropriation directly impact, directly impact the health and wellness of black individuals and communities across the state, across the country, historically. Uh, this threatens economic development. It also threatens our social, our health and wellness of everybody. Uh, in fact, what we're seeing is, is it even threatens our very democracy. So what we're doing here uh, in uh, Vermont, you know, along with the, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, is, is we're also creating some of those programs and services. Uh, we are, we're operating, we're figuring out ways in which we can uh, develop and deploy policies and platforms and initiatives, uh, cultural engagement. Um, so one of the things that we saw probably a couple of years ago was um, a vision of the Richard Kemp Center. The Richard Kemp Center was, it was created uh, as, a, um, as a center um, uh, to, to sit, uh, I should say to center the needs of the black in, uh, community in rectifying uh, racial equity, racial, racial inequity by serving as a cultural broker in expanding historically ineffective, inefficient, and non-existent programs and services to marginalized communities. Uh, the Richard Kim Center is creating new systems that empower black Vermonters denied uh, equal access to public or uh, or private economic and other opportunities. And also the Richard Kim Center um, offers hope by being the legacy maker, if you will, uh, at the intersection of the black community's wellness, our culture, and also our youth. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about our legacy makers. And we're here uh, with Christine. Christine, tell, tell us a little bit about some of the things that you have going on over there. Uh, maybe, um, maybe you can also bring us up to speed on what's, uh, what's happening uh, in moving forward. We have lots of things going on. We're um, really excited to be just coming back from our trip. That'll be an annual trip to the National Museum for African American History and Culture, mm. which was a huge undertaking that mm. went really well. Mm. That was really exciting. Um, I think that that's something that we look at as cultural empowerment. Um, the the youth and families that traveled down there with us mm -hmm. have given us the feedback that it was it was great it was a blast and we're already starting to plan for that trip next year um, on a regular basis we have all kinds of activities that are I'm gonna stop you right the there center. on that trip down to, to DC you know as we, we, we I think we got a slide on that too with some of the youth uh, out by the bus um, but yeah, yeah taking, the, taking the folks down to D.C., that must have been a logistical nightmare. As, was, I mean, how, how'd that work out? I mean, how many days were you down there and what did y'all see? We were there for four days. We had a day of travel on either end. We, um, you know, set it up so that it would coincide with the spring break that the kids had from school. So I think that was pretty good planning. Yeah, um, yeah. We went down there on a bus and... It, it, I guess it was something that there could have been a whole lot of things that <laughs> could have gone wrong. You think? And, but they didn't. They <laughs> didn't. So, you know, God was on our side. And it, and it was, it was a, a huge success. I mean, I think, you know, all of our team members had a role to play. The youth even had a role to play in our fundraising efforts mm -hmm. and really um, showed up and showed out, you know, and, and really, I think not only was 
were the efforts that they put into it successful, but it was also, you know, another opportunity to empower them to, you know, make something happen and be part of something right. that they were going to actually experience. So the youth were, they, they were actually a part of the planning. They were. So was, so is that something that on, like on the front end before you guys went down there, you had the youth engaged in something or? We did. So there was, and there are three parts really to this adventure that we took. There was a, the part before it to bring people together and to mm. sort of form the group and make sure everybody was getting to know each other so mm. it wasn't just a bunch of strangers hopping on a bus. Mm -hmm. And then there were activities that we um, conducted while we were down there. Going to that museum is a pretty intense experience. Yeah, so, yeah. so we designed it so that we would have time and space for our own wellness and our own reflections. Um, and now we're kind of in the phase three part. We were fortunate enough to have um, somebody who is a videographer working on a mini documentary. Andy Wait, Bennett. so you took, you took a videographer to, to DC with you? Sure did. <laughs> oh yeah, boy. It was great. And he's okay. somebody that we've worked with um, for some of our other events and he's working on that right now. So our plan is to, as the third phase of this activity, is to share that mm. um, that documentary with the broader community and offer another opportunity for our youth to share the experience with with the broader community. So that's that's the phase three part of it, and then we'll just be thinking about you know making our plans and doing our fundraising to go again next year. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean definitely you got my vote with the with the youth and and I I guess they're going to be a part of uh, some post post trip activities uh, involved in various activities just following up on the trip. Right. I mean I think that one of the things that we're hoping and we're sort of in the planning stages with is that there might even be an opportunity when we have our open house mm -hmm. at the Richard Kemp Center, mm -hmm. that will actually be on Juneteenth. Well, it'll be on the Saturday before the federal Juneteenth, which falls on Monday. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we'll ha we're hosting an open house on that day, so I hope folks will plan to come out and we're hoping to you know, provide some opportunities for the youth to take part in that as well. Yeah, I mean, I never thought we'd be saying words like federal Juneteenth, but yeah, definitely. Uh, Definitely. So some some of the things we're doing definitely involve the youth. I know um, the this trip very very powerful. Um, what else What else is happening in the Richard Kim Center right now? So on a regular basis, we have things like the Chess Club that happens. Mm -hmm. I believe that happened mm -hmm. just last night. That's been yep. going really well, and there's a lot of participation in that. Um, we also will have youth movie night which is happening this friday that's a blast we usually have like a really nice group of kids a lot of a lot of them are sort of like regulars you know they look forward to that we do that twice a month mm -hmm. um and lots of other things too look at lots that. of other um, regular just pulled activities up a slide. i just I, I was just reminded of the summer activities that you have coming up as well right um you want to you speak a little bit more to, to that as well? Right. So that's another thing that, that slide. we'll be kicking off right around the, the time of Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. We're in the process right now. We have like an open enrollment. We're hoping to enroll somewhere around 25 youth mm -hmm. from the ages of like eight and up all the way up to, you know, potentially 18. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be having activities uh, during the summer in the center, we're, we're planning some field trips. We're also um, leaving some room too f for again, for parents and youth to even be involved in designing some of those activities. Sure, yeah. Each day we'll have a theme. Mm. So it's like art and music and cultural so empowerment. So each day of the week? Right. And then you'll just repeat that over the following, the following week or right. so? Right, right. I was thinking, uh, it's a long summer. You're gonna have a different theme every, every day of summer. No, that's a, that's pretty amazing. So so there'll be, this is gonna go out through, through the going through out the duration of the summer. Right, is that Monday through, Monday through Friday. Uh -huh. We're we're really excited that we're gonna be able to offer free lunch every day. We're working with the Burlington school district to make that happen. Hey, so, now you got my attention. So. Right. So that we're really excited about that. We are in an area where, you know, there's a lot of poverty and stuff. So we're really excited to be able to offer that. And that will happen at the beginning of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have, yeah, I'll, we'll have a theme for each day. 
So it's yeah, art, yeah. music, education, awesome. um, cultural empowerment and celebrations, mm -hmm. and then probably some local field trips, yeah. you know? Um, so we're, we're still working on some of that, but we have the basic framework set up. Yeah, I know the, the original plan uh, for the Richard Kemp Center involved, you know, very, very aggressive visions, you know, because what, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with poverty. You just said it a minute ago, because that's, that's the whole, I mean, that's the whole jam right there. The political and economic divide along racial lines, that's, that's the legacy of slavery. That's, that's the, you know, that's our jam. That's what we're here for. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know we talked a little bit about um, envisioning. We talked about stuff like adult basic education, for example. And, um, you know, we talked about basic computer skills and, mm -hmm. and maybe some workforce development uh, opportunities might be coming out of there. Um, you know, and where are we on some of those things and what are your thoughts on? That's a great them? prompt, great segue <laughs> into another <laughs> campaign that we're in the middle of. Thanks for reminding me. Mm. We are in the middle. We have just had a Better Places grant um, and fundraising campaign mm. launched that is um, looking pretty good. I just checked it a little while ago before we got on the air. And Better Places? We have, yeah, we have steady uh, donations that are coming in. So it's 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 a Better Places grant. We're uh, working with Patronicity, and it's basically a crowdsourced funding right. apparatus. Right. Um, and what will happen when it's successful is that our fundraising goal is somewhere around ten thousand. I think it's like ten three or something. Once we meet that goal, we the state matches that, mm. um, and then we'll use those funds to do some revitalization mm -hmm. in the center, mm -hmm. which includes um, purchasing computers and workstations right. that will be available for public use. So I'm really excited about that. I think that that is a huge benefit for youth and for our adult community members right, right. who are also accessing the center. Right. So those will be available for public use, but will also create some programming around that, around you know, maybe learning about credit scores and like you had mentioned, mm -hmm. basic ed um, mm. and some other programming that we're, we've been talking about for a while and now we're actually gonna have what we need to, to roll it out. So we need it, we need it in community. I think for, uh, for those who are watching, uh, just I think you can go over to uh, vtracialjusticealliance.org, vtracialjusticealliance.org over on the blog. I think there was a, a press release that was released this morning, if I'm not mistaken, or either yesterday or today, but I think it's one of the latest blogs. You can find in that press release the, um, the breadcrumbs that will take you to uh, that campaign and you can get involved. So I would just ask you to just go and check that out. It's not about how much you give, it's about how many people give. I mean, obviously, I'm sure you guys would like to make it to 10-3, of course. but it's important to engage uh, the community uh, on this. Right. Um, I understand that you're also on the other side of Juneteenth um, is, or leading up into Juneteenth. Is there another block party on, on the horizon? Um, I mean, the next block party that we'll probably do is... Trying to talk her into it. It's probably, it's probably I mean, unless somebody, you know, changes my mind about it, I think mm. the next block party that we're probably going to do is our annual mm. back-in-school block party. Right, right. Who knows? I mean, between now and then, we might we might pull one of those off. It was a great success, and the community really loved it. Yeah, you know, we had we were able to shut the street down, a section of the street, uh -huh. which was really fun. And we had a, you know, we had a basketball hoop out there, and we had the fire, our our local firefighters come over with the fire truck, and right. that was really um, successful. And it was really it's such a nice community building thing, especially as we were still kind of coming out of the whole pandemic thing it was really nice to bring people together out there um so we will do another one of those i mean right now we're thinking that it's probably going to be more like the back in school time of year but i don't know mark you could maybe convince me to to try to do one before then because who doesn't love a block party right i know everybody's talking about housing 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 um activities planned around because I, I know I mean and I so it's so important too to start from the beginning on this because I think a lot of folks I was talking to somebody um, today and they were like yeah there, there there are plenty of um, activities there are plenty of organizations in the city of Burlington that say for example do things for children that that help you know black children and uh, and they were you know there was 
saying, you know, it's, uh, and I was like, let me help you. And I, I named Sarah Holbrook and, and uh, Miller, uh, as well as uh, King Street and, and the Boys and Girls Club. Um, but when we got to, um, when we got to the Richard Kemp Center, I said, you know, this is, you know, it's, it's really important to delineate the work that's happening here because, you know, the origin from which it, it comes, you know, the reason why we started the work in the Richard Kemp Center is because what we have is not working. Mm -hmm. because, because the systems that we have in place across housing, education, employment, health services access, economic development, transportation, the so-called criminal justice system, none of them are really working effectively for black people. Mm -hmm. And they never really have. And that is the definition of systemic racism. So amongst all of the other things that the Alliance is doing, one of the things that we thought was, is it'd be a good idea to, hey, let's do something in community. Let's put something in community. Let's put a, let's put a, not just, you know, putting a flag down, but, but let's stand up a flagship that supports black and brown folks in community. Uh, because what we know is, is when, as we said at the opening, when systemic racism is working well, it doesn't just hurt black folks. Uh, it also hurts our economy. It hurts our public safety. It hurts our democracy. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, when we start talking about, again, back to housing, when we start, we we're having these conversations, it's just important to know that we're having them, we're having them in the Richard Kemp Center as well. Right. Um, yeah, talking a little bit about that, sorry for being so verbose, you're probably going to, later you're going to be like, what? Mark, we get it. No, well, okay. I'm just trying I'm, to explain I'm, it to I'm everybody tracking. else too, you I'm know. Tracking. <laughs> so, yeah, so with housing, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, aside from one of the functions that the Racial Justice Alliance has had, I think for a couple of years now, where we have a limited amount of resources to respond to urgent basic needs in the community and that has actually been something that's been functioning across the whole state. I think that that's been really good. It'd be great if we had more resor resources to do that but I think yeah. one of the things that we recognize about that is that we don't want to just do the band-aid thing so we can help somebody when they're in the middle of a crisis but we also want to be able to see and have access to some of the systems that you know you've just mentioned so that we can speak into them and and work with them and improve them believing that you know the folks that are running these other systems are also interested in changing those de desperate uh, outcomes that you can see across all mm -hmm. systems yeah. so one of one of the one of the local organizations that we've been partnering with and sort of just getting off the ground is Champlain Housing Trust Okay. Um, and so, you know, there's more to come with that. There's not a whole lot I can say about that right now, but we it's do- Secret for right now. Well, no, I mean, it's de I would say it's developing, okay. right? Okay. And we've brought together a focus group. We have another one that's coming up. Um, so that's really exciting. And it's an opportunity to, rather than just you and I sitting down with, say, Mike Monty, mm -hmm. it's a group of people and community members who are impacted mm -hmm. by housing and the issues with housing, yeah. sitting down with their folks who are trying to roll these programs out and really having an opportunity to speak into those systems and tell them what's working and what's not working. And even sometimes being, you know, having enough creative space to talk about other options or so, other ways to approach it. How do we get community involved in that process? How are you getting community involved in that process? I mean, we're, we're constantly doing different types of outreach, you know, like, like even, housing specifically, housing specifically. Well, I mean, I think that's part of what the focus group is working on mm -hmm. that we would sort of, it's kind of like the each one teach one or the each one reach out to another one because we want to be able to have as many community members speak into those processes. And even in some cases, just to be educated about what's out there, because mm -hmm. a lot of times there are wonderful things that are out there that somehow or another just miss our community. Right. Um, so I think that we do like that kind of concentric circle building 
So we have a group like a focus group that are folks that are already sort of dialed into what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then we try to expand out from that. And you're doing that in, in different areas, whether it's like with the youth, whether it's like with mental health, mental, mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, with the, the plans are is, is to bring in a small focus group and just have have folks kind of like sitting around the fire, throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, mm -hmm. uh, figuring out, OK, what's. You know, what's missing with these programs and services? Why are they not maybe bringing the subject matter expert in, you know, the, somebody from the CHT, somebody from, I don't know, the health. I know somebody we've had somebody in from the mental health department recently mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And having those conversations and maybe um, creating strategies to bring folks in and to and to bounce stuff off of folks who are from designated agencies, for example, and say, hey, this is not working, to be able to make something move on those while at the same time um, you're creating your own. You said a mouthful, though, uh, earlier when you, when you were having a conversation about the concentric circles, each one teach one. Mm -hmm. um, more about that? Is, how, what's that look like? I mean, I think it's sort of an organizing model. You know, I think that we do that. We've done it more so with our adult community members, but I think that there are ways to do that with uh, the youth members of the community as well. But I think that one of the things that is can be easily overlooked is that we are blessed to be able to create safe spaces. I don't wanna do that little air quote thing because it's a real thing, it really is. And it's right. something that a lot of times is just easily overlooked. Like there might be organizations in town that say, oh, you know, come on in to our annual meeting or something because we really want to hear what you have to say, mm -hmm. not understanding that sometimes for a person of color, for, for black and brown folks, even showing up in some of those spaces mm -hmm. doesn't always feel that safe. Whereas in the Richard Kemp Center, because it's a community building place and we already have a lot of folks that are dialed in, it becomes a safe space. Yeah, and, and if know? those, if I guess, you know, we keep saying it over and over again, but I'll say it again tonight. If, if, it's, if it was working, we wouldn't be here. You know, it's, hey, everybody's pretty busy here. There's a lot of stuff going on. I got other things to do. If, it's, if it was working, we wouldn't be having these conversations. And I think that's really the key point that we want to drive home, that we want to continue to drive home with our partners, mm -hmm. with our community partners, as well as those from designated agencies who are partnering in the work that you're doing, is, is because for, you know, and, and sometimes uh, folks get stuck on intent and they get, well, you know, we're doing the best we can. We're not perfect. Well, you know, the, it's, it, you know, the service is here. It's always been here. I don't know why your people are missing it. And so, but at the end of the day, what's most important is it's not working. Right. It's right. not, so that's, I think that's your message is what I'm hearing from you more than anything is, is we're gonna try alternative approaches to get folks, in, to get folks plugged in and we're gonna, and, and I think it, 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 what it sounds like is, is it helps everybody. It sure does. At the end of the day, because I mean, what impact is that having on these agencies that are delivering these services that truly wanna do it better and do it in a more equitable manner? Right. It, when we're able to create, you know, environments where, you know, we might be doing like a listening session or mm -hmm. whatever, and especially if they're sort of the smaller, more intimate, like focus groups, they learn. Yeah. They really learn. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's really important to understand is that it's not necessarily like an either or. We certainly don't have the capacity to, to deliver housing services the way that CHT is, that's their thing. That's what, what they're they here to yeah, do. Yeah. And they're gigantic. So um, what we want to be able to do is speak into the, into the way that those services are delivered. And by having those focus groups and having a, a community that's kind of dialed in through us, we're able to do that. And I mean, again, it, it's, it's really important to say that it's not necessarily an, an either or, it's more of and. Yeah, yeah, we just I want to throw up this last slide before we get out of here. I know um, I really appreciate you being on uh, with me tonight. It's, I, I always feel so much comfortable, uh, so much more comfortable um, in having a, a conversation and engaging with anybody mm -hmm. uh, when it's you. So thank you for coming. I, I, I hope you keep coming back. There's the first open house I see that you have coming up here mm -hmm. on the 17th. That's right around Juneteenth. 
lots of stuff going on. Speak briefly to that. Yeah, one of the things, I mean, I'm excited about the whole thing, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is a project that we're going to actually kick off on that day, but it will be ongoing to honor local black history. Um, and when I say local, I mean throughout the whole state. I feel like there's a lot of attention, and it's understandable, mm -hmm. um, you know, in that one month that we're given for Black History Month to talk about, you know, the big rock stars and the big people that are getting like national attention. Mm -hmm. But I don't want us to overlook all of the incredible history makers and legacy makers that are right here in Vermont. And I feel like I'm not sure why nobody else has, has already thought of doing this, but I think that in the Richard Kemp Center, it's kind of the perfect place to do it, that I've envisioned a, a wall or some space in that space that will be honoring local black history. You get the last word. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. Thank you for all of the work that you're doing at the Richard Kemp Center. It is honoring your father. It is honoring your father and you, if he was, I'm sure if he was around today and I knew this guy, he, he'd say you were doing him proud. So he, said, he told you not to quit, Mark. Right? <laughs> don't tell everybody that. Thank you so much again. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, Legacy Makers, it's the Legacy Maker at the intersection of the black community's wellness, culture, and their youth. Christine Hughes, the Richard Kemp Center. Have a good evening.